In the last 15 years or so, maybe 20 years, a very powerful, a very exciting, a very influential development has occurred within American philosophy. It's the development of a new movement called Reformed Epistemology. I want to spend a few minutes talking about Reformed Epistemology because it eliminates one very important challenge to the Christian faith that should never have been raised in the first place. That challenge says that the first step that any Christian apologist or anyone pretending to do Christian apologetics must do is prove the existence of God. Let me relate a story as I understood it happened. It was a debate that occurred in Dallas, Texas many years ago between a very, very good Christian philosopher named Alvin Plantinga and a very influential British philosopher named Antony Flew. They were on a platform in a large auditorium to debate the existence of God. And the anti-Christian Antony Flew, at an early stage in the debate, uttered a challenge somewhat in these words. He said, Dr. Plantinga, unless you first prove to me the existence of God, I will not listen to anything else that you have to say. You have the burden of proof. You must prove that God exists. And Dr. Plantinga simply said, I do not have that obligation. I don't have to prove the existence of God at all. And what followed was, a, was brought, uh, elicited chuckles from a lot of people in the audience. Antony Flew said, yes, you must prove that God exists. And Dr. Plantinga said, no, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Now, among other things, I want to explain what was going on there. Antony Flew was issuing what we call the Evidentialist Challenge. It has a name, and that's the name, the Evidentialist Challenge. Flew's position is that before a Christian can merit a hearing in the debate about Christian theism, he must first succeed in convincing the non-believer that God exists. Otherwise, the non-believer will not pay any attention to anything else. That he, well, that, that, that is, that's a bad way to approach all of this. And what I want to do is show you why that challenge must be rejected. I want to show you why that challenge is wrong. And in the process, in, in the process I want to explain what Reformed epistemology is how Reformed epistemology answers that objection, all right? But let me begin first with a little history. In recent Christian writing about epistemology, philosophers apparently operating on different tracks have found agreement on an important point. In the case of my own track in the theory of knowledge, which is a kind of Christian rationalism that receives its received its first formulation in the writings of St. Augustine. It is a mistake to accept an extreme form of empiricism that claims that all human knowledge arises from sense experience. Older advocates of this empiricism used to illustrate their basic claim by arguing that the human mind at birth is like a tabula rasa, a blank tablet, or if you will, a blackboard without any writing on it. According to this theory, of the tabula rasa. At birth, the human mind is like a totally clean blackboard. Absolutely nothing is written on it. In other words, human beings are born with no innate ideas or knowledge. As the human being grows and develops, the senses supply the mind with an ever-increasing stock of information. All human knowledge results on this model 
from what the mind does with ideas supplied to the senses, the basic, the basic building blocks of human knowledge. That's empiricism. My alternative to this extreme kind of empiricism can be summarized in the claim that some human knowledge does not arise from sense experience. As many philosophers have noted, human knowledge of the sensible world is possible because human beings bring certain ideas, categories, and dispositions to their experience of the world. The impotence of empiricism is especially evident in the case of human knowledge of universal and necessary truth. Many things in the world could have been otherwise. The computer I'm using at this moment happens to be brown, but it could have been red. Whether it is brown or red is a purely contingent feature of reality. Whatever color the computer happens to be, it could have been colored differently. But it is necessarily the case that my computer could not have been brown all over and red all over, or any other color, at the same time and in the same sense. The necessary truth that my computer is brown all over and not at the same time red all over cannot be a function of sense experience. Sense experience may be able to report what is the case at a particular time, but sense experience is incapable of grasping what must be the case at all times. The notions of necessity and universality can never be derived from our experience. Rather, they are notions, among others, that we bring to sense experience and use in making judgments about reality. How do we account for the human possession of these a priori categories of thought? Now, let me explain that. The word a priori is Latin, of course. And it means independent of sense experience. What I've been claiming is that human knowledge is possible only because human beings bring with them to their experience of the world ideas, categories of thought, innate ideas or dispositions that play an indispensable role in, of, in human knowledge but are not themselves derived from sense experience. According to a long and honored philosophical tradition that includes Augustine, Descartes, and Leibniz, human beings have these innate ideas, dispositions, and categories by virtue of their creation by God. In fact, this may well be part of what is meant by the phrase, the image of God. After all, Christians believe God created the world. It is reasonable to assume that he created humans such that they are capable of attaining knowledge of his creation. To go even further, it is reasonable to believe that he endowed the human mind with the ability to attain knowledge of himself.